We position our hearts before you, Abba. And we make our spirit vulnerable to you. Come and strike us with a divine spark. Come and release that progressive seal of divine fire upon our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Session 19, the bridal seal of mature love. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. Verse 6, set me as a seal upon your heart, a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Its flames are flames of fire. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. The Holy Spirit is preparing the bride to have a loving and a leaning heart. Now this is one of the great uh, glorious accomplishments in the grace of God of people in this age. To have a leaning heart and a loving heart is of the highest magnitude of supernatural power because the human heart is so prone to opposite dispositions outside of the grace of God. It requires the supernatural power of God to produce in the people of God a loving heart and a leaning heart. This is a summary of the purpose of the whole The whole journey in the book is summarized in this sentence, having a leaning and a loving heart. She's leaning, she's loving at the end of history. At the end of natural history, God has a bride that is, the first commandment has been restored to first place, and she's walking in apostolic weakness, and this voluntary weakness of leaning upon the Lord. Historically, at the end of of natural history, God will have a victorious church that leans and loves. And throughout church history, God has had those individual tokens of what will happen in a widespread way at the end of the age where these men and women that have emerged as bright lights through church history with a leaning and a loving heart. I believe it's uh, fair to say that the way that we can define a successful life on the earth Inasmuch as we have grown with a leaning and a loving heart before Christ Jesus. I believe that is the clearest definition of success that any person can have. That they would have the first commandment restored to first place. And they would walk in the voluntary weakness of a heart that leans upon the Lord. Consciously decides to lean upon the Lord. One main purpose of her journey was to learn how to walk in these two kingdom dynamics. Again, these two that define spiritual success, which in essence defines all success of earthly life. These come to a culmination in these three verses. These three verses define success. They define the goal of Christian living on the earth. They define where God is going to bring the end time church. The Holy Spirit's prophetic declaration of the bride's victory. That's how it starts. This produces hope in the bride. Then Jesus reminds her of her past journey. This produces gratitude in her. He awakened her under the apple tree is is the phrase. Then Jesus is manifest as our bridal seal. He releases his power upon her emotions. And the great reward of the bridal seal, she is filled with spiritual pleasure and and spiritual satisfaction. She has an overflowing heart. The sealed heart is an overflowing heart. The sealed heart is is a fully romanced heart in the Holy Spirit. She has a heart that is walking in the great reward. She has spiritual pleasure and satisfaction unrelated to earthly circumstances, which means she finally is free. When we overflow in joy, unrelated to circumstances, we are free at last. And we will all have an overflowing heart free of earthly circumstances when we're in eternity. But God's 
Through history, God has had his servants like Paul the Apostle, men and women through history who have touched this ultimate liberty while in this age. And I believe the church at the end of the age will walk in this spiritual pleasure unrelated to natural circumstances, the romance tart, and they are free. Paul said it in Philippians chapter 4 when he said, I have learned the secret. I am content in all things, in prosperity or in pressure, His heart overflowed in love. Prosperity did not disrupt him, and neither did pressure. He learned the secret of life on planet Earth and the Holy Spirit to enter into the sealed heart, the overflowing heart, the fully romanced heart, free at last. Should have added here that in in Revelation 15, the bride stands on the sea of glass like crystal mingled with flaming fire. The sealed heart in divine fire culminates with the bride standing on a sea of fire. She's singing the song of the Lamb and she's overcome the great flood of Satan's rage. And we'll look at that very language uh, as, as we develop this, uh, uh, this session. But in Revelation 15, 2, she's in full victory in the fire of God, overcoming the floods that could not quench the fire of her heart. Fully victory over, victorious over Satan, filled with powers emotionally. And this is Jesus' gift to his bride. That we would live with an overflowing heart on the earth. You know, we cannot come to Jesus and have him touch us without significantly making us better in every area that we gave to him that was sacrificial and costly to us when we initially gave it. We come to him to sacrificially give and we walk away with ten times more than that which we sacrificed. His gift to the spiritually violent, fully romanced bride is a heart overflowing in love on the earth, free from all earthly circumstances, filled with love. People talk a lot about the uh, price they pay. When, as we look at the end of this session, this session 19, we'll see that the very power to love and the joy of feeling loved and the joy of loving back is the great gift God gives His people in this age. And it's so much greater, that gift, than any sacrifice that we could ever make. Okay. The Holy Spirit's prophetic declaration. Who is this coming up, out, coming up from the wilderness? The Holy Spirit gives a prophetic proclamation of the bride's final victory. He's producing hope in the bride ahead of time. As the Holy Spirit looks over human history, he asks the rhetorical question, Who is this that has persevered through tribulations unto a mature bride? Who is this with a loving and a leaning heart coming up out of history? The Holy Spirit is prophesying her inevitable victory. The inevitable victory of the corporate church coming out of natural history, she will be victorious. Again, Revelation 15, verse 2. She comes up victorious, Revelation 15, 2 says. I believe Revelation 15, uh, verse 2 and 3 and 4 is directly related to Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5 to 7. It would be... It would be uh, Very edifying to compare the two passages together. The bride enduring the pressures of a a fallen world. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? The wilderness, in a personal sense, speaks of our testings and temptations and difficulties in this life as God is training us in righteousness. The wilderness, in a general sense, speaks of a fallen world that is filled with sinful human beings under the influence of Satan. Galatians 1, 4 calls it this present evil age. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 calls uh, Satan the God of this, uh, of, of this world. This world, this dark evil age is a wilderness for, from which the bride will ascend in victory. The bride's victory over all obstacles. Who is this coming up? And it's the words coming up that we want to highlight. The Holy Spirit sees the people of God coming up in victory through the wilderness. She comes up. She is she is not descending. She is ascending in victory. She didn't quit. She's ascending. She's 
She's coming up in victory through the time of, tri- of tribulation, uh, tribulation and testing on the earth. You will not quit. The end time church will not quit. There will be no reason to quit. The Lord will woo her in power with the seal of fire upon her heart. She will come up victorious. You won't quit and you will come up victorious. Coming up also speaks of ascending at the second coming or at the resurrection from a fallen world to enter the eternal city. The bride was urged by Jesus to raise up, to rise up, to go with him to the mountains. In fear she refused, but now she rises up to go to the mountains. However, we find out it's the mountain of spices that she's ascending. She's ascending to the mountain that the Lord called her to back in chapter 2. But now, she, with, to her great delight, it's the mountain of spices that she's ascending. It's the, it's the full glory of God that she's ascending or coming up. That's the destination that she's ascending to. The bride is motivated and empowered by love and gratitude. She's leaning upon her beloved. The divine love released and imparted is the only way that we will not quit in the wilderness. Anyone can quit except for a person in love. Anyone can quit but a person in love. A person in love can't quit. They have no choice. The very power of the love in their heart gives them no options to quit. You will not quit. You'll have no need to quit. God is is about to release a greater measure of the seal of fire. She fully embraces weakness as she acknowledges Jesus as her only life goal and her only life source. She's leaning upon her beloved. This speaks of apostolic weakness that Paul embraced. It speaks of being committed to a life of voluntary weakness. The fasted lifestyle. It's a voluntary weakness that causes her to to lean. It's a weakness that's rooted in conviction and revelation. It's a revelation of, of her weakness that causes her to lean. You say, well, that sounds pretty obvious. No, because the, the body of Christ is indescribably weak in the natural, and yet so few of The members of the body of Christ lean aggressively into the heart of God because we still live and count on and have confidence in our own resources. The fasted lifestyle is a statement of poverty. It's a statement that says, I don't have the sufficient resources. I have no option but to lean because I see how poor and how weak I am. Weakness, voluntary weakness, is the, is the fruit of revelation. A praying man or a praying woman is a person that has the revelation. They're bankrupt, so they pray. They have no resource. Only weak people pray. Strong people don't have any need to pray. Only weak people pray because they have no confidence to face the future without drawing on divine resource. Only weak people fast. Only weak people give because they need the Lord's involvement in their money. They have no confidence to go forward without supernatural involvement. Only weak people draw with this fierce, tenacious, holy holy resolution into the resource of God. And the phrase that I'm using is the phrase apostolic weakness. It's voluntary weakness. John the Apostle leaned upon Jesus' breast as a prophetic picture of the end-time church fulfilling this loving and leaning heart. The Lord promises His Son a bride with a leaning heart of loyal love that doesn't stray in seasons of prosperity or adversity. The history of God's people reveals that we don't often lean in love in the midst of blessing. It's in the place of prosperity where God's people lean the least. In the place of circumstantial strength, of natural strength, we lose our awareness of our, of our weakness. And we tend to do more and to run in the resource of natu- run in the strength of natural resource. 
Whereas natural resource may be abundant, natural resource is insufficient. It may be abundant, but the deception is that abundant natural resource makes us strong. Abundant natural resource leaves us deceived and therefore more prone to live stumbling than those with the revelation of their weakness. That's why it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom because a rich man has a secret confidence in the ability and the power of his riches to help him if he gets in big trouble. And it's difficult for a person to walk in revelation with natural resource to believe in their weakness, their, 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 uh, ultimate, I mean, their ultimate weakness, though they have natural strengths. A person endowed with great uh, intelligence or finance or any kind of abilities or even a prosperous ministry, they, they tend towards drawing out of the place of leaning fiercely and tenaciously upon the Lord because they begin to have confidence in the position of strength that the Lord has even granted them. The need and the value of leaning is what I discussed, uh, discussed here. It's very rare. Yet it will be common in the end day church. I talk about how the prosperous quit leaning. It's just the principle I've just developed. Ways in which we lean upon Jesus. Those are ways of which we lean upon him. There's several that I don't have on this list, and the Lord will just develop this. This is not a comprehensive list. I want to talk about aposto- voluntary Apostolic weakness. Jesus wants a bride who voluntarily remains in weakness as she feels the power of the Spirit upon her. This is how Jesus walked when he was on the earth. He had the power of God available and flowing through him, but he would never move out in anything that was not the perfect will of the Father. He said no to his own will and lived in perfect resolve to the Father. He would not draw on anything but the resource of the Spirit. His own will he laid aside. She voluntarily chooses to submit her strengths or her resources to the Holy Spirit in weakness rather than using them to establish her in strength in natural things. Again, this might sound a, a, a little bit uh, uh, like, huh, I never thought much about that. But it's a very, very significant principle because if you remember uh, chapter eight and chapter seven and chapter eight is about uh, leadership principles or apostolic leadership, chapter seven and chapter eight. Voluntary weakness, to consciously submit to a place of weakness out of conviction before God. For example, the fasted lifestyle is voluntarily submitting to weakness. Again, you only pray if you believe you're weak. Ministries or believers that don't prioritize prayer are ministries or believers that don't believe they're weak deep in their heart. Only weak people pray, only weak people fast, and usually only weak people sustain giving in a way that the Lord would invite them to. It's because we don't have confidence to go forward outside of the strength of God, and our joy is to live in the strength of God. And to live in the strength of God, we have to say no to natural strength. Voluntary strength. Let's, let's take the opposite. I don't have that written here. Means viewing our resources as belonging primarily to us. Voluntary strength, the opposite of voluntary weakness, when our natural resources, we view them as belonging primarily to us. So we can use them at our discretion instead of yielding them to the Lord. We can take advantage of any opportunity that is not unrighteous and evil, we'll we'll say yes to it. But Paul the Apostle understood he belonged unto the Lord. And even his own strengths in the natural he would not use. In a way that was outside of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. She sees her strengths as this which can hinder her in her deep life in the Holy Spirit. I realize I have a few of you still kind of, huh, you're working on it. Well, just keep working on it. I have a, a bit more in the notes here. I'll give you a, a verse that 
says it as clear as any place. This speaks of apostolic weakness that Paul embraced. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation. Paul says, lest because of the abundance of the anointing of the Lord upon me, I begin to operate in my own human pride. That's natural strength. I begin to move out of the place of consciously uh, uh, of, uh, of leaning, and I begin to use my powerful gift of revelation to open doors and to get the job done. As though the revelation belonged to him. Operating in our strength is so common that it's difficult to even imagine what the church would look like consciously submitting to weakness as a conviction. Feeling the power of God, but not using the millions that comes when the power of God's available to you. Feeling the power of God, and multitudes of people will, will follow your, your, your any word, your any beckoning, they will follow, but never using that to lead them anywhere but to the Lord. Tremendous anointing and influence, never using that to stand against those that oppose you as your enemies, but blessing them in intercession, and never using your clout and your position of influence and prestige to stop them. It's those kinds of things I'm talking about. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon a man or a woman in a in a in a uh, unusual way, the finances and the and the, the authority over people, the doors that open is just tremendous. God's going to have a church who doesn't view those circumstances of blessing as part of the strength that they live out of. It's the apostle. And the power of God that has a million people following him can be rebuked by a new believer or can be challenged and attacked by somebody with no clout and they will never use carnal means to stop it. It's that kind of thing I'm talking about. It's called apostolic weakness. She's leaning on the Lord. She says, Lord, I could many ways solve many problems, but I'm not going to solve them by the arm of the flesh. Let the enemies rage against me. What would happen in the body of Christ if the servants of the Lord used prayer and kindness to diffuse their enemies? It might take 10 or 20 years to stop them, and they may never be stopped, but the power of God would be abundant and would flow. That's what I mean by weakness. Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times, and the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient, here's the revelation, for my strength is made perfect when you stay consciously in a place of weakness. When you stay there, living in intercession is submitting to weakness. Living in fasting is submitting to weakness. Blessing those that oppose you is living in conscious weakness. He says, my power will be perfect if you will stay submitted voluntarily to weakness. Paul says, therefore, this is what a stunning revelation. Most gladly, underline the word most gladly. Most gladly, I boast or I rejoice in the realm of of this lifestyle of staying within the sphere of weakness and not using my strength to remove my problems. Now, that's a, a delicate thing to talk about. Because the most gladly, Paul's talking about a voluntary decision here. Because I'm not talking about, in some ways I shouldn't bring it up just in the course of the Song of Solomon, but I need to because it's present here. Because the irresponsible say, therefore I won't go get a job and I won't work, I'll just let the Lord pay all my bills. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having the availability of resource and staying in the boundary lines of the Holy Spirit and not using the resources, though it's ours because it's available to us. I believe God's going to raise that men and women that by the anointing of the Lord will fill the stadiums of the earth and the millions of dollars that will be available to them. And they won't touch it but to minister to the poor and release the gospel. They will live simple lifestyles. They will stay in the boundary of weakness consciously, voluntarily, in order But the gospel would go forth. That's what I'm talking about right here. Paul the Apostle was such a a magnificent shining light as a man that had such power at his disposal. He had multitudes he could marshal if he wanted to. 
more, tremendous economics, tremendous intellectual abilities. Yet the Holy Spirit held him in check and kept him in boundary lines and said, Paul, if you stay in these boundary lines, more will happen for the glory of God, though you might look foolish staying in the boundary lines. Paul was one of those examples of history that had a leaning heart as well as a loving heart. It's very contrary to nature. I outlined some of the ways of which we submit to, vol- we voluntarily embrace weakness. In weakness, I'm not talking about sinfulness. I'm talking about putting ourselves in a position where we don't use power to triumph over others when the power is available to us. That's what I'm talking about right there. Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example. The God of such indescribable wealth, walking on the earth with no place to lay his head, born in a manger, cursed and ridiculed by the nation, but he would not correct that except in the, in the timing of God, which you'll correct it when he stands in the sky in flaming fire with all the angels on the last day. But as a man, Jesus lived in the boundary lines of weakness. The Sermon on the Mount is a lifestyle of weakness. When your enemies rage against you and you can solve the issue and you bless them instead, that is apostolic weakness. That is weakness at its finest. To have the answer and not to use the answer. David had Saul at the end of a spear. And he says, far be it from me to touch you. Yes, I can, I can kill you, 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 26. Two times he goes, I can get rid of you. But that's not the Lord's way. He says, the Lord will get rid of you. I won't use my resource to get rid of you. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus reminds her of her past journey. He's awakening gratitude. That's the power of the bride in eternity, I believe, is this unrelenting gratitude from her understanding of her life on the earth. I believe that we will understand our life on the earth when we're in eternity in a way that produces gratitude in our heart, which becomes one of the main sources of our loyal love forever is gratitude. I don't believe when we step into eternity that the Lord makes sure that we never say no to him, but the power of gratitude will be fueled. He awakens gratitude. And he reminds her of her history when he awakened her and refreshed her under the apple tree at the beginning. It's the Lord reminding of her of what he did. He's provided the bride with lifelong refreshment on the earth, and she's grateful. She lives in the overflow of the gratitude that God awakened her and refreshed her when she had no knowledge of him. It's the Lord revealing his goodness to her all along, and the power of gratitude is what this is talking about. Jesus is our bridal seal. Jesus is speaking. Set me as a seal upon your heart. Set me as a seal upon your arm. For the love of God is as strong as death is. The love of God is as jealous or divine jealousy is as powerful as the grave is. It's as unrelenting as the grave is the idea. The jealousy of God will not take no for an answer, just like the grave won't take no for an answer. Jesus invites her to set him as a seal upon her heart. Set me as a seal. Jesus is the bridal seal. He's the one that seals the heart of the bride. He gives her the romanced heart, the sealed heart, the overflowing heart. Jesus is extending an invitation to her to take him as the seal on her heart. Her journey started with a longing for his kisses, and it ends up with a seal of love upon her heart. She ends up with a longing and she, uh, for kisses, a longing for intimacy, and it ends with a sealed heart, a romanced heart, an overflowing heart. The seal in the ancient world. In the ancient world, a royal document such as a title deed or military strategies were authenticated by a royal seal. A royal seal was a wax seal. The title deed 
was a royal document sent from one king to another, for example. The king would encase the document in wax and put his seal upon it, and the seal functioned like a signature. So this encased, this document uh, in the form of a scroll rolled up, encased in wax, like an inch encasement of wax all the way around it with the royal seal upon it, of which the seal was well known to the neighboring kings and nations. Or the wealthy people in the nation, their seals were well known, their signatures were. A sealed document spoke of the king's ownership, his protection, and his authority. The king's army protected the king's seal. If if the seal was broken, everyone that was carrying the seal was executed. The entire power of the empire was behind that seal and guaranteed the contents of that which was sealed. And I develop that a bit more. When the Lord seals the heart, the divine guarantee is behind the seal. The power of His kingdom backs up that which He seals. The divine source of the bridal seal. It's a seal of fire that He puts on the hearts of His people. Its flames are flames of fire. It's a seal made not of wax, but it's a seal made of divine fire. The seal is none other than the power of Jesus released by the Holy Spirit. It's the fire of God on the human heart. It's flames or flames of fire. It's the Father's love empowering sinful human hearts to love Jesus. Jesus Jesus prayed in John 17, 26. Father, the love that you have for me supernaturally release it into them. Make them recipients of the love you have for me. Supernaturally impart into them the love that you feel towards me, Father. That's what Jesus was praying. It takes God to love God. And Jesus is asking the Father to impart His own quality of love into the human spirit. The very fire of God. It's a most vehement flame. These paragraphs, it's the the most powerful flame that can exist. There's no flame more powerful. It's the very flame of God Himself, it says in the Hebrew. And I have that written out there. This is the source of the bridal seal. It's flames or flames of fire. The fire of love manifests itself by tenderizing our hearts so that we feel some of what the Father feels when He looks at His Son. Our hearts are by nature hard, dull, and insensitive to the things that God feels in His emotional makeup. There's nothing more precious and pleasant to us than to be empowered to feel what the Father's feeling when He gazes upon His Son. And that's the very fire, the very flame of God Himself imparted to the human spirit. It's flames. The New American Standard translates the phrase flames, or the word flames, as flashes of fire. I love that. God's fire flashes in the human heart. A flash of fire comes powerfully, suddenly, and soon wanes until the next flash comes. And that's descriptive of how the Lord leads us in this life. There's those moments where the flash of God's presence engulfs our hearts and it empowers us. And then the Lord allows that f- the, the feeling of it to diminish. And then again, He comes like a flash of fire to empower us. And we go from strength to strength that way. There are times where He tenderizes us suddenly as a flash of fire. Then as suddenly as it comes, it seems to leave. And our heart waits with grand, great anticipation for the next visit of His flashing, tenderizing fire. It's the very flash of God's fire when it comes. But over the months and years, we are steadily going from strength to strength in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the seal. This seal is our heavenly King's seal. It is not the wax seal of an earthly king. It's the seal of fire of a divine king by the Holy Spirit. Solomon, the king, writing this love song, understands the wax seal of, a, of an earthly king. He had a wax seal. I mean, he, had a, he sealed documents with his, his royal insignia was placed into the seal, the, the royal seal on the wax. 
the seal operates as the person of the Holy Spirit releasing the power of Jesus. The seal is none other than the person of Jesus released by the Holy Spirit. Set me, Jesus says. Set me. How do we do that? By setting our heart before God. There's no mystery. Again, people ask me all the time, how do you do it? I go, really, there's no mystery. It's costly, and it takes time, but it's not confusing. You just do it one day at a time. You you set your heart before the Lord by filling it with the Word of God in a devotional prayer context. Uh, The very first session, we handed out a way to pray, read the Word. To pray, read the Word means you fill your heart. You put fuel into your heart. It's the Logos, the Word of God. You fill your heart with the Word of God in a devotional posture, and that's key, in an I love you mode. I appreciate the the student mode. I'm in the student mode plenty of times where I'm studying and researching and trying to understand with my mind. And the student mode is a good mode. But a student mode isn't sufficient to set your heart on fire. It's the lover mode. It's the bride mode. It's the romance mode. It's the meditation on the Word of God in the posture of heart that says, I love you. It's reading it, turning the Word into conversation that enhances the romance between you and the Lord. And again, the first session I laid it out on a page or two, how, how very simply how to pray, read the Word. It's costly. It takes time. It takes time in the course of the, uh, of, of the day and the week, and it takes time in the sense that it's sometimes it's months and years before we understand discernible difference, but those months and years will come and they will go. Matter of fact, they will come or go whether you put your heart, fill your heart with the Word or not. They still come and go. People say, oh, I can't wait that long. I says, well, you're going to anyway, I promise you. So it's costly in terms of time in the sense that it takes us time in the day and it takes us time over the, in that marathon pace. It's like I tell people, lock into a 10-year mode. And in 10 years, if your heart is not romanced, then you might have a, 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 a a valid complaint, but it's impossible that that would happen. So how do you set the Lord before you? By setting our heart before the Lord. That's how we set the Lord before us. We take the Word of God, put it in our heart in a devotional posture, and you're putting a bullseye in your heart. You're, you're putting your cold heart before the bonfire of God. That's how you set Him upon your heart. There's no other seal besides Jesus in the present tense. The importance, the importance of cooperating with the Holy Spirit, with the posture of soul or heart that's reaching to Jesus for fellowship. Make time to interact with Him in His Word. Prayer and fasting is not the seal. Jesus touching the heart is the seal. Or the Holy Spirit, or God touching the heart. Let's just say it that way. Spiritual disciplines increase our capacity to receive from God to become tenderized. The power that tenderizes us is the power of God, not the spiritual disciplines that make us in a position to receive the power of God. The spiritual disciplines posture us to receive. The spiritual disciplines do not change us. The very essence, the very substance of God's power in life is what changes us. The spiritual disciplines posture us to to receive the free empowering of the Lord upon the heart. Some people think there's something magical about spiritual disciplines. It's the spirit that has power, not the disciplines. The disciplines simply posture us. The discipline is the activity we exert to get in front of the fire, but it's the fire that warms the heart. It's not the the energy and the activity to get in front of the fireplace. It's the fire that warms you. The disciplines simply posture us before the Lord to receive the fire of God in the cold heart. The disciplines are essential because as raging as that fireplace might be, if you don't take the exert the energy to get in front of it, it's not going to warm you. But spiritual disciplines in themselves have no power in them. They only bring us into the presence of the power. And they act as a catalyst to receive more quicker. The seal of the heart speaks of the way we carry our heart or the way we identify and define our life. Our past victories are not the seal. 
Our past victories are not the seal. The great miracle the Lord used when you laid hands on somebody or the great prophecy or vision or the great uh, release of the power of the Lord where 10 or 20 people met the Lord in a small period of time or a great victory over a, 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 a difficulty in our life, a temptation. Our past is not the seal. The seal on your heart is not your past record of failures either. Some people posture their heart according to their mistakes. And they come before the Lord. The way they carry their heart is, Lord, I, I sin this, 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 and this. And, they, and the way they live as though their record of failures, is, that's what's sealing their heart when they come before God. That's not our seal. I don't come before the Lord boasting on what I've accomplished in the grace of God, nor do I come before the Lord lamenting everything I did wrong in the past. I come before the Lord saying, a cold heart, you, your fire is what I need. I don't even bring that other stuff. The fire is the seal, not those other things. And the reason I'm saying this, because so many people, they, they allow the counterfeit seals or, or religious seals to block their heart from receiving. That's why I'm saying this. To some people, their seal is their future promises. They define, some people define their whole life by their future expectations that one day they will be anointed and there is such agonizing pain today because their anointing that God has promised them never comes and they can never enjoy God today. They're in so much anguish about the anointing that's going to come and it never comes. The Lord says, I am here in front of you as a flaming fire and you have blocked your heart with a seal, another seal besides my son. It's the seal of what you're believing about the future. I, it's important to believe right things about the future. But when what we believe about the future blocks our heart from receiving the fire of God in the present, then it's become a religious seal that blocks our heart. The seal of fire is a progressive seal. That progressive seal begins at the new birth. It's not like you go to a meeting and one day it's over. I don't believe in that. I believe Ephesians 1.13, we're sealed the day we're born again. And that the release of that seal in our human experience increases. It's progressive. But I believe the Lord's going to release a tremendous amount at the end of the age. It's a two-fold seal. It's upon the heart and it's upon the arm. It's a seal on the heart that speaks about God supernaturally empowering and warming and tenderizing the affections. The seal of fire tenderizes and warms the heart. The seal of fire empowers the arm, which speaks of our labors or our ministry. It's the seal upon the arm. The seal on the heart is the first commandment. The seal upon the arm is the second commandment. It's the arm of labor, the arm of ministry. When the Lord seals our arm, I, I want you to, to, to read this. It's important, not now, but basically what I'm saying on the arm being sealed is the Lord wants us to conduct ministry in a way where ministry is sealed by the fire of God, where ministry doesn't burn us out. Many people are burnt out and they lose their love in God, their first love, while in the very rigors of ministry. But He wants to seal our labors in the fire to where we grow in love instead of diminish in love by laboring in the Lord's vineyard. Burnout right now in the ministry across the Western world is really at an all-time high, I believe, of, of, uh, in, in the last several hundred years. The chronic burnout and discontentment and disappointment and anger and pain in the leadership in the body of Christ in the Western world is, is at, a, it's at a serious level right now. Their labors are not sealed with the fire of God. The labor diminishes their love instead of enhances it. And I, and I talk about that. Not only is the sealed arm, meaning our, our love is enhanced, new discoveries of the Lord while ministering in the proper balance of the Holy Spirit. It implies ministering in the proper balance of the Holy Spirit. What that means is we can't take every opportunity of ministry and do everything and still and, and live without burning our hearts out. The sealed arm is what we need. We need ministries operating under the fiery seal of God. Not only do we need to find new discoveries of the love of God in our own heart while we're ministering, but the Lord wants our arm of ministry to impart the love of God to others, to awaken other people in the first commandment. 
The Lord wants ministries that set other people on fire for passion for Jesus. The sealed arm. The last thing we want is religious bureaucracy where the meetings may be big, the money may be, be big, the conferences may be big, the, mill, the mailing list may be big, but the hearts are cold and small. It's, in the end, it's nothing. It's nothing in the end. Big ministries with small hearts, big ministries with cold hearts, and burnt out leaders seems to me like a great deception. The seal is upon the arm, not only upon the heart. The Lord says, I want to position you in ministry where you find, where you experience new discoveries of the Lord while ministering, and you impart zeal and passion for God while in the labors of ministry. The comprehensive nature of, of the bridal seal. It's, it's a divine love that is as strong as death. And the place of the word strong, it's as comprehensive, it's as prevailing as death is. How strong is death? How comprehensive is death? Death claims everything living in the natural order. God is saying that he has a love that he will impart that will prevail over everything in the natural order. Just like death prevails over every living thing in the natural order, the imparted love of God can conquer every sin, every disappointment, everything that rises up against the knowledge of God Demonic or human can be overcome. It's a love that is as comprehensive and as prevailing as natural as death is in the natural realm. Nothing can escape its grasp. And I talk about if our heart is submitted to the Holy Spirit, He can free us from every, everything that would seek to extinguish this seal. It talks about the many waters cannot quench love. The waters of obstacles, pressures of everyday life that hinder us from receiving the impartation of divine love. I have five types of waters that quench love. I have those listed. Five waters, pressures that quench love. In the notes I have written here that water by nature always puts fire out if you have enough of it. But this, this fire is not a natural fire. It's a supernatural fire. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And no water could put it out. No disappointment. No imprisonment. No uh, addiction to some perversion in your life now. No water is stronger than this fiery love if submitted to, if we yield ourselves to this love over the long haul. Anger can be conquered. Lust can be conquered. Disappointment can be conquered. This love, if we open our spirit to, nothing can conquer it. It conquers everything. Every water and flood will come up defeated before this raging fire. The great reward of the bridal seal. He says, set me as a seal upon your heart. Its flames are a flame of fire. The waters can't quench it. The floods can't quench it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Just in my next uh, three or four minutes, I want to just summarize this. It's a proverb that Solomon puts that magnifies the glory of love, the power of love. I have an illustration that I've used for years. The young couple hears their little girl has come up with a terminal illness. The doctors say, you're going to have to empty your bank account. You're going to have to sell your house. They say, well, we have five million in the house, so we have five million in the bank account. He says, it's going to take everything, everything. Everything you've accumulated for generations, everything, but we can save the life of the little child. The parents agree to do it. They save the life of the little child. The neighbor comes up to them, meets them someplace in the marketplace and says, wow, you know, you've moved from the neighborhood, the big wealthy neighborhood to the little apartment. We hear you're bankrupt, you're poor. That was courageous. And the parents look at him in the eye and say, don't, don't, you don't understand. That wasn't noble. We gave up all the wealth of our house, all that we've acquired. And we despise the recognition that what we did was noble because the power to love is the reward itself. 
They said, no, it's not noble what we did. We love, and that's all we wanted. We don't want recognition. Paul the Apostle touched this principle, and I have it written here. He said he considered it rubbish, everything he gave up. And people think, well, that's really nice. Paul meant it. Paul had an enlightened heart. He had an overflowing heart. He had a sealed heart. When they came to Paul and said, you gave up everything, he says, compared in the balance of what he gave me, it really is rubbish. I want no recognition. I want nobody honoring my commitment because in the balance of what he gave me, it is nothing. He, they utterly despise the recognition of nobility because the sacrifice is not justice in the eyes of the lover. The power to love is the only reward that they want. The great reward of the romanced heart. To feel loved and to feel love back is all they want. It makes their life transcendent. It frees them from fear. It frees them. They can be in a prison and be overflowing in the love of God. And we're going to look at that romance heart in the next session. The next session is the development of the romance heart. A prophetic word that was uh, given to me that changed my life. And I believe it, it will have relevance to some of you in this room. Well, all of you, really. I have just some of the details written out here, but I'll just give it to you briefly. July 1988, I'm in uh, my office after a prayer meeting, a morning prayer meeting, and I begin to open Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 and verse 7. And I was asking Jesus to be the seal of power to love him. I said, Jesus, seal my heart. I was putting my cold heart before that bonfire. And I was quoting John 17, 26. Father, the love wherein you love your son, put it in me. And I was just tenderly opening my spirit before the Lord. I just began to gently weep. And the presence of the Lord began to be discernible. I picked up the phone. It's the only time I've ever done this. It was a... A uh, uh, something that, that that was remarkable. It was something that was distinct. I called the receptionist. I said, "I know the prayer meeting. We just finished it, but I'm having another little prayer meeting here." And typically, I'd have meet uh, meet with people that time. I said, "I don't want to meet with anybody right now, no matter who calls." I said, "The Lord's touching my heart, and it doesn't happen that much." You know, hey, it's happening. You know, I've got the kite up, and the wind's blowing. I'm going to stay out there in the wind. Let's do it. And I said, really? I said, so give me, you know, X amount of time. So 10 minutes later, the phone rings. I'm a little surprised. Pick the phone up. Hello. And the receptionist says, "Uh, I know you don't want to be interrupted, but he was giving a story of one of the prophetic men in our history named Bob Jones. Most of you have heard this story. He says he's on the other end, and he says the Lord has spoken to him He's wide awake by, by the thunderous, audible voice of the Lord. He just spoke to him concerning you. And he says, and the receptionist says, I thought you would want God to get in. I mean, is that okay? I said, yeah, always let God in. If God calls, always let the Lord in. So I say, hello, Bob. Bob says, I'm in the car. I mean, he says, I'm uh, running late. I only have about a minute or two, literally one or two minutes. He goes, my alarm was, uh, didn't go off, and somebody picked, is, is out in the car to take me to the airport for ministry, a ministry trip. He goes, I woke up, and I was sitting in my bed, and I missed my alarm, and the, and the thunderous, audible voice of God came to me, resounding in power. And he spoke to me a word to give to you. He says, and I looked up at the clock, and the guy came in five minutes knocking at the door. He goes, I haven't had a chance to look it up. He goes, I don't have a clue what it is. He goes, I got in the car, and the Spirit of God nudged me and says, go tell Mike right now. So he says, we backed the car up. I ran, and I literally have 90 seconds. I says, go ahead. What's the word? He says, I don't have a clue even what it is. The Lord told me by the audible voice of the Lord that he is going to release The anointing of Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, upon the church worldwide in this generation. He says, I don't even have a clue what Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 says. He goes, I thought it only had four chapters. He goes, it has eight chapters. I go, yeah, it does. He goes, I haven't had it. He goes, it has to. He goes, whatever Song of Solomon 8, 6 is, God's going to do it across the earth in this generation. There's an anointing that's there. He goes, I don't have a clue what it is. He goes, I don't understand the Song of Solomon at all. And I go, neither do I. 
He said, secondly, the Lord told me to tell you that this is going to be the focus of your ministry for the rest of your life. He told me that audibly to tell you that. He said, so whatever it is, that's what the Lord's calling you to the rest of your days. This is 1988. I hang the phone up. I mean, I'm, I'm reading Psalm 86 when the phone call comes. The Spirit of the Lord's on me. And I, I'm, I'm tremendously stirred by the Lord in that moment. But then I get up from it and... And, and I have three reactions over the years. My first reaction was, I didn't appreciate that. I read the song, I went and read the Song of Solomon, and I said, Lord, this is a funny book. I mean, roses and fragrances and colors. I said, give it to the women's ministry. No, for real. I, I read it. I said, this discourages me. I, 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 don't, I don't like it. You know, it doesn't look good to me. I like chapter 8, verse 6, but... I read through it. It was horrifying to me, honestly. I don't mean that's a little strong. It, it, I, was, I was, my heart panicked. I was not happy. I'll just say it that way. I was raised, my father in the natural was a professional boxer. He was a world champion boxer. I was raised in the gym, trained as a boxer, around professional boxers. And my father was involved in the mafia, for real. It sounds like a movie, but it's real. And I hung out with guys that got killed in their cars. I knew a number of guys that got killed in their cars. They found their bodies dead, family, friends in the car. I grew up in taverns with my dad. He took me every weekend to the taverns for years. I said, Lord, I, I, I give me the life of David, the book of Romans, Revelations, but not Song of Solomon. So then by faith, I just begin to say to the Lord, I, I know it's a good calling. So I began to study it. I began to get every commentary. I said, I'm doing this by teeth gritting faith. I see nothing here that interests me. And every now and then one little verse would kind of be a little interesting. It was so confusing. And I just began to read it and I began to instruct my mind. And it started little by little breaking up my heart, the fallow ground of my heart. Then I began to turn it into prayer, just a little phrase here or there. And then it took a life of its own. It began to grab me begin to pull me in. Now, so my first response was, I didn't appreciate it. My second response was, I'm going to approach it by faith with no feeling. And the third response is the response I've had these last number of years. I am absolutely ravished by this calling. And the Lord has given me permission to pray over people in whom this is their life calling. And that's what we're going to do after the end of the next session. We're going to pray over people in whom this is your life calling. You may not have the audible voice of the Lord in a prophetic circumstance like this, but hearing this testimony, you're going to say, yes, yes, that's me. And it may not just be the Song of Solomon, but it's the bridal paradigm of the kingdom. And let me say this one last word, and then I'm going to pray over you. Although we're going to have the ministry time a little after the next session. I said, Lord, this, again, give this to the, to the women's ministry. And let me tell you this, the Song of Solomon does not undermine your masculinity, men. It will establish and enhance your masculinity. David was the romantic of all the ages. Jesus, I, I, I mean of all church history, and Jesus is the romantic of all the ages. Don't be afraid of this man. Open your spirit. The Lord is about to put this seal of the fire of love upon the church worldwide, and he's going to call some of you the very people in this room. Some men that say, I don't know, he's going to call you to this life focus as the focus of your ministry all the days of your life. That doesn't mean you won't do anything else in ministry, but it will capture the focus of your ministry. Calling the body of Christ to the first commandment through the revelation of the beauty of God. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to pray for men right now. Maybe you're, I was a tough guy. I realize I'm a wimp now, but I, I, I was a tough guy in my own thinking. The Lord called me to Song of Solomon, the first commandment, the romance of the gospel. I like men right now that have struggled with this idea of the romance of the gospel. I just want you to come. But in your heart, you're saying, yes, Lord, this really, I've struggled, but this is who I am. I know this is what I'm called to. I want you just to come and stand right here just for a moment. Any man, this enhances, this will enhance who you are as a man. This will not in any way undermine or minimize your humanity. I mean, your masculinity. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, 
visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.